right, good evening everyone and welcome to Chapman Auditorium on the campus of Francis Marion University and this, the Social Media Symposium, to everyone here in the, uh, in the audience, in the auditorium, welcome to all of you watching on public access television. No, this is not Dancing with the Stars. However, stick around, you just might learn something. Uh, this, uh, for the past two days, we've been holding discussions on social media and the impact that it has on our lives, specifically focusing on politics, and we're going to continue that tonight. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is John Sweeney with the Morning News, and I will be the moderator for tonight's panel. And tonight we will be hearing from the professionals, those who have been not just following the trends of social media and politics, but actually setting them and actively participating in them day to day. Uh, again, my name is John Sweeney. I'm with the Morning News as well as News13 and SCNow.com. I'm the uh, political writer, I guess you could say. I also have a vlog, not a vlog, I'm too lazy to write a blog. So I do a vlog, which is actually a video, law, a video blog. It's on YouTube, uh, J. Sweeney Morning News. It's not that I'm trying to plug it, but uh, I'd like my audience to include more than just my mother. But let's get along to, the, uh, to our wonderful panelists here tonight, starting with uh, the, the lady sitting right here on the very end here, Ms. Nancy Mace. Now, Ms. Nancy Mace actually is uh, a bit of a historical figure herself. She is among one of the first uh, female graduates of the Citadel in 1999. Uh, she also is one of the key developers of the website Fitz News and uh, is the head of a consulting firm, Mace Group, in Atlanta. So welcome to you, Ms. Mace. Seated in the middle, we have Lauren Manning, um, who worked as a staffer for Barack Obama's 2008 campaign in South Carolina. And she is the media director, or she was the media director of gubernatorial candidate Vincent Shaheen uh, during last year's uh, governor's race, and formerly authored two South Carolina blogs, SC Soapbox and uh, Lauren Line. So welcome to you as well. <laughs> and I should mention she's currently digital media strategist uh, and community manager with Salsa Labs, Inc. Correct, excellent. And then finally, the gentleman seated, uh, seated rather, on the very end of the table here, uh, Brad Worthen. Uh, you can tell that he is a print media man for the statement listed in his bio. He is a hater of, quote, all political parties that actually exist. You just became my new hero, sir. Uh, he spent 22 years at the state newspaper where he was the editor of the editorial pages uh, and is currently the director of public relations at ADCO, uh, a marketing and advertising company in Columbia. So welcome to you, sir. Adco. Adco. <laughs> Words. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, for the format for tonight, we are going to be hearing from each panelist individually, uh, and they will be giving a presentation on exactly how they are involved with uh, each end of social media. And then we will be opening it up to questions from the audience. So without further ado, let's get things started uh, with Ms. Manning. Hey there, my name's Lauren Manning, and uh, it feels great to be back in the PD. This is actually home for me. I grew up in uh, Hartsville, so I have, uh, I've been over to Francis Marion many times in my life, and uh, it's great to be here. So um, to get things kicked off, uh, I actually am planning on focusing a little more on the campaign end of things um, than the blogging thing, but end of things, but... I've done both, and so I'll be happy to, to talk about either in the discussion, but um, the nature of this presentation is more focused on you know, how campaigns are employing uh, digital media tactics. And uh, right here, I've got my little tribute to Steve Jobs, rest in peace. Um, but here we go. Um, this here is my uh, pet monkey, Madeline. Um, this, this picture is actually taken in the bunker of the Ohio Democratic Party um, during the 2008 election cycle at my desk um, there. So one of my friends thought that would be funny. But I uh, thought I'd talk a little bit first about how um, a campaign with the resources, obviously most campaigns don't have the resources of a presidential campaign, but ideally if you were to have the resources to uh, staff up um, a big new media team and really cover all the bases, this is... Uh, this is sort of how it would be broken out. Um, and this is, this is based on the, uh, the 2008 campaign, but my understanding is it's probably more or less similar to how things are set up this go around. But, um, and, and these are just sort of the, the basics of, um, and now it's called digital media. You know, you'll find that I uh, keep slipping into calling it new media, but I guess they decided that um, it wasn't that new anymore. So now it's digital media. 
But um, obviously, you start things off with your website. Um, it's interesting, though, because, you know, whereas, I mean, that you, the website's definitely still sort of the nucleus of your campaign on the Internet, but increasingly, things are moving to mobile and, uh, and more and more activities happening on Facebook and other places. So um, this, this continues to evolve. But, you know, right now, um, you know, you obviously start with your website. And really the most important way that you interact with your supporters from a new media standpoint on campaigns is through email. Um, it's cheap, more or less free, other than the cost of the software. Um, and, uh, and you can really create sort of a sense of intimacy if you do it well. Um, and your supporters can really feel like they're getting to know the campaign and, and the people who are working on it. Um, social media, uh, some people use that term as more of an umbrella term for all digital media and you know all facets. But when I use that term, I'm meaning more specifically Facebook and LinkedIn, MySpace, if that's still around, um, those sorts of things. Uh, and then blogger outreach, that was actually something that was one of my focuses on the Obama campaign, um, was to try and cultivate relationships with bloggers who were going to be favorable, um, who were going to hopefully give us favorable coverage if we, uh, if we worked with them. But it, it definitely didn't always work that way. And um, we wouldn't necessarily reach out to the ones who weren't so friendly. And there are certainly plenty of those. Um, video. Um, Mobile, this is the one that is really the one to watch, especially this coming campaign cycle. Um, you know, more and more we don't even interact with the internet by clicking on our browser. You know, we've got an app for everything that we want to do online uh, on our smartphones. So, um, web ads, another uh, interesting one for this cycle um, because the, uh, the technology continues to get better and better, and by manipulating data, people are able to you know, better target. Um, you know, who who they're talking to on the web. Um, and then finally, analytics. And that's probably the word up there that's the most foreign to most of you, but it's also the most important. And um, you know, that's basically keeping track of, of uh, you know, how your tools are working and who's interacting with your website and you know, how you can grow your audience and grow your list of supporters, et cetera, et cetera. Whoops. OK. The three M's of online activism. Basically, anything that a campaign is doing online should boil down to one of these three things. And if it doesn't, you really shouldn't be doing it. And you know, I would cringe when I get some of these campaign emails because I've subscribed to all of them just for fun um, or for headaches. And uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes I get these emails, and I'm like, what was the point of that? You know, that was basically a journal entry. It didn't ask me to do anything. It rambled. Or it asked me to do 57 things, which is also bad. Um, but, you know, these, these three things, you know, whatever you're asking your supporters to do, it needs to boil down to one of these things. And, um, you know, probably the one you think of the most would be message. Um, but, you know, all of them dovetail together. And uh, let's see here. Spam is bad. Don't do it. This is the one that's the most frustrating to me. Um, and probably to many of you who wind up on lists and don't know how you got there. Uh, I try to tell every campaign that I work on that it's absolutely the worst idea ever to steal email lists, borrow them, buy them, otherwise obtain them in any way other than getting, your, getting the email address from the person themselves. Because, you know, if you don't sign up for an email, chances are you probably don't want to receive it. And it's also really bad because it affects your open rates. You know, if you're sending a message to 100 people who didn't ask to be sent the message, um, they're probably not going to open it. And if they do, they're probably going to be mad about it. And then you're going to have to take some poor staffer's time to uh, you know, answer these angry messages. Um, and they are very angry, and I have answered my share of them. So. Uh, it's much better to build a list organically. And um, the Obama campaign actually built their 14 million person list. It's actually bigger than that now, but it's somewhere around that neighborhood completely organically. You know, Obviously, it's a little easier to do in, in, in that scope, but you um, should absolutely never, 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 never email somebody who hasn't asked to be emailed. So your list. In campaigns, you talk all the time about building your list and checking it twice. But, um, and this is super important, and it's also something that, in my opinion, most campaigns in South Carolina don't 
do particularly well. For example, um, I think yesterday I got an email invitation to uh, from the governor to a town hall in Aiken. <laughs> Um, I definitely, I did sign up for that list, but I definitely don't live anywhere near Aiken. So you shouldn't be sending your entire South Carolina email list invitations to Aiken. You should be sending them to people in Aiken or near Aiken. So, um, and they're not the only ones who do it. Um, but that's, when you sign up for these political websites, a lot of times they'll ask for first name, last name, and zip code. Well, the zip code is so that you can geotarget. So presumably if you have that information, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be uh, location-based targeting. So um, that's definitely something that you want to do. And that also works for campaign donations. And for example, if you've given $50 to a campaign before, that campaign next time should ask you for a little bit more than 50. They should ask you for 100 specifically. It shouldn't be this blanket, give $5, $20, or $100, or $1,000. That's more the kind of ask you would get on a flat mail piece where maybe you don't have the information about someone's donor history. But this is definitely an area where um, lots of campaigns here could, could stand to improve, um, especially if you have all the data. And most of the time, for people who are signing up, who are your real supporters and are going to be the ones most likely to donate, you do have it. So, um, but there are ways to capture information, and you know, one of the most important things that a campaign can do is make sure that it's easy to figure out how to subscribe to their list and you know, get people involved in the campaign. You, you don't want to have to, to dig to find, you know, where do I go to tell this campaign that I support them? I mean, if you have to look, then that's a very poorly designed website. Um, and the easiest way to do this is with a splash page where the first time you visit a site, you know, there'll be a simple page that pops up asking you to sign up before you get to the main page. Um, but then also you can do things through online ads, um, social media, et cetera. What your list is not, and this is something that candidates never ever believe. They think the internet is this magic place where you know, once you've got your campaign online, you should just be able to pull this lever and all this money is going to come flowing because that's what happened in the Obama campaign. Well, no other campaign is like that, and they're probably not even like that as much this time. But um, so anyway, uh, that's something that can be hard to do is to um, uh, control expectations. But generally speaking, um, you know, the money that comes in online is going to be small money, relatively speaking, at least at this point. And um, another thing about this is that people get really tired of being asked for money over and over and over and over and over. So you want to make sure that you diversify what you're asking people um, to do, whether it's watch a video or um, attend an event or, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Forward this email to a friend. Sign a petition. There are tons of them. Um, and, you know, the more you can get people engaged doing things that aren't related to donations, then that increases their stake in the campaign and they're gonna be more inclined to give down the road even if it's just a little bit. Data is gold. This gets back to what I was talking about, about how um, you really should be specific in who you're talking to with, uh, with your email correspondence and um, just generally your targeting. Um, and this was something that I learned a lot about in the Obama campaign in, in 2008. And you know, we, would, we would track every single thing possible. So when we had um, Oprah Winfrey come uh, to williams Bryce Stadium, we had this elaborate system set up where, uh, well, first of all, people had gotten their tickets online. The tickets are free, but that way we got all their data. But just in case, we also had it set up so that there was no way to enter williams Bryce Stadium without being hit by, you know, attacked by one of our volunteers. I mean, it started in the parking lot and went all the way to the doors. It was, probably a couple thousand volunteers. It was really ridiculous. But that way we made sure that when all of that was over, we would know exactly who those people were who were at that event so that you know, we could then call them after that and find out were they supporters because you know, there were a lot of people who just want to see Oprah <laughs> and, and we knew that. Um, but then you know, get an answer as to whether or not they're a supporter and then that helps you figure out whether or not you need to mobilize them on election day because you obviously don't want to turn out everybody on election day, you just want to turn out your own people. So um, data collection is key and you know, the more the better. And this is something that 
historically, Republicans did a much better job than Democrats. And the Obama campaign, and I didn't have anything to do with that part of it, so I'm not claiming credit for myself, but, um, you know, they, the data team was able to sort of build on those lessons and a lot of things that marketers do um, in the private sector. And let's see, here we go. Um, this is one of my favorite politicians, Senator uh, Claire McCaskill of Missouri. And um, she's got a great quote here about using Twitter. And um, this is sort of kind of kind of a non sequitur, but I just like it. Um, and I think that probably being her press secretary would be about like being uh, Fritz Holling's press secretary. <laughs> um, it's occasional, um, the authenticity is awesome, but occasionally you wind up with a lot of stuff to clean up. <laughs> but um, I, I know that it has to give her staff a headache that she has this portal through which she communicates to her fans and non-fans, but um, she really does do it herself. And this is another thing that I really try to instill in candidates and sometimes um, don't really get anywhere. But you know, people can tell if you've got a staffer writing your Twitter account. Oh, it was great to be in Orangeburg. Love the fish fry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's boring. Nobody wants to read that. It's not worth doing. But you know, if, if you actually have a candidate who, and I wouldn't advise every candidate to, to use Twitter. In fact, most of them, I would probably <laughs> advise them not to use it. But um, certain ones you know, really can help to you know, convey personality and really sort of create a, a sense of um, closeness and, and, and whatnot. Um, but y'all should definitely check her out on Twitter because her tweets are funny. Um, I mentioned some of this before. I love this cartoon, um, totally nerdy. But the reason that cartoon is in there is because a lot of this targeting that I was talking about is done through cookies um, on your computer where uh, a campaign can tell if you visited a, or anything, you know, can tell if you visited a site before. In fact, Zappos is the worst about this. You go and look at a pair of shoes on Zappos, and those shoes will chase you around the internet for a month. Um, and Mitt Romney does that too. Uh, so he, he chased me around the internet after I visited his website with these, uh, that's called retargeting um, when a website does that. And, you know, they, they keep that data, you know, that your computer visited their site, and then, you know, they stalk you through Google ads. Um, so it's a little creepy, actually. But, um, and then micro-targeting, uh, sites like Facebook that constantly mine our data um, have made this really easy to do. And, you know, I want this message to go out to um, females who, have, who are independents between the ages of 30 and 50 and whatever. You know, I mean, there you've given all of that stuff to marketers. So um, also a little bit scary from the privacy standpoint. But uh, you can't do all this awesome stuff if you haven't managed your data properly. So I really want to underscore the importance of that. Um, sort of uh, jumping again here, um, and I know y'all are here to talk about campaigns in South Carolina. Um, and I actually want to note that I was not affiliated with the Shaheen campaign in general, so I'm not dumping on myself here. But um, it blew my mind that neither campaign uh, did Google advertising that I could tell in the general election. I, I went and you know would look up if you Google Nikki Haley, you know you you should have Nikki Haley's campaign site right there under the sponsored link section in Google, so that. You know, the campaign wants that because they want to control what information the, um, the viewer or the person using Google is getting. Um, so it's super, super, super important and not very expensive. Um, and that's, those are just the words. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. And it's also in the um, right-hand column. But that's something that if you're going to run for office, do that, please. Um, there was some cool digital stuff done in the primary in 2010. Um, and the Republican side, but interestingly enough, and maybe this is a point we should cover more in the discussion, is that the people who are doing it both got creamed. Um, it was uh, Henry McMaster and Gresham Barrett both spent a lot of money um, building beautiful websites, and they both had Facebook apps. They were the only, um, well, I guess in the general election, Haley had an app that allowed you to donate through her Facebook page, but it wasn't it wasn't anything as cool as what McMaster and Barrett did, but they both lost. So, you know, I'm not really sure. Maybe we're just not there yet in South Carolina. But, um, 
And the work that was done here uh, in the 2008 campaign, frustratingly for me, is just totally seen as an outlier. And, oh, well, nobody's Barack Obama. Well, that's true, but a lot of the organizing practices um, would carry over, the, the, the same best practices would carry over to any campaign. And, and it makes me sad that, at least on my, sides, uh, my side, that, that we're not doing more of that organizationally. And maybe some of you were uh, affiliated with that around here, but... Um, you know, I can go into greater detail uh, on that in the discussion, but um, anyway. And hopefully you're not asleep by now. Um, I got a little nostalgic looking at my old campaign pictures, and this was actually also in the Ohio bunker um, in 2008. But anyway, that's all my contact information, um, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions in the uh, question part. So I'm going to turn this over to who? Are you coming back up here? Okay. Excellent. There you go. I did not fall asleep, but I'm a nerd as well, so that's okay. Uh, next, we will hear from the, uh, I hate saying the proper journalist, because you're all journalists in, in a sense, but um, I'm a news, well, I'm a newspaper guy, so I'm a little bit biased too. So, Mr. Worthen, take us away. Well, first, I am here to learn. I didn't know I was going to be here to learn, but when I, I got here and, and Lauren and Nancy were here, I decided I was here to learn because I'm, I'm properly in, in, intimidated. Um, Lauren was, was kind of a mentor of mine. When I started blogging in 2005, uh, something I started doing because um, I found print too restrictive. Um, I, I just had a lot more stuff I wanted to say. Um, uh, she, was, she was out there blogging and doing a fantastic job and uh, constantly offering me advice, which I, I took as well as I could. Um, I am a, uh, I'm, not, I'm not someone here to, to tell you how to do any of this stuff. I just do it and uh, uh, with, with, with mixed success. I, I'm totally self-taught. Um, I was the only person really actively blogging when I started at the newspaper. And uh, I, I'm sort of the same way with uh, social media in that I just do it on my own and uh, don't have any help with it. Uh, so uh, I might tell you some really stupid stuff, but it's worked for me. Um, I, got, I got into social media uh, for one reason, just to promote my blog. And when I say social media, I'm talking about Twitter and Facebook. Uh, a little over two years ago, I had, uh, I had a Facebook page because uh, my youngest daughter's uh, boyfriend was, was killed in a car wreck, and his sister uh, put up a lot of comments and pictures and everything. Uh, on Facebook and urged everybody to go look at them there in the comments and everything, so I, I, I created a page. I mean, I created a, a, an account, and that's about it. That's, that's all I'd done with it. And I was uh, actually at, uh, I was right after I left the newspaper, right after I was laid off from the newspaper, um, I uh, uh, was, at, was doing some work at uh, University of South Carolina, uh, doing a 90-day stint, uh, uh, doing some uh, communications consulting for, for President Harris Pistides. And uh, one day, uh, some folks came in to give the president uh, a briefing on uh, social media, which he's very suspicious of. Um, he was kind of suspicious of me because I, I blogged. And afterwards, uh, I was talking to one of the people who was there. Actually, it was, uh, it was Tim Kelly, whom... whom uh, was, was also, in, along with Paul DeMarco, who's here, was also an early uh, commenter and friend of my blog when I started. And uh, uh, I said, Tim, I said, I don't know, Twitter stuff or anything, that's just really stupid, and, and I see no point in it. And he said, you can use it to promote your blog. So I said, okay. That day I set up an account and immediately became addicted. Um, I, you know, I started my career in uh, 1975 as a copy editor, which meant I wrote, um, wrote headlines. Well, I edited the copy, wrote headlines, laid out pages, all that kind of stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, this was something that I knew how to do. I mean, really knew how to do. You know, I was, I was really making it up on the blog. Um, but it was, it's headline writing. You know, that's all it is. And, and, and my tweets, for the most part, uh, essentially consist of you know what, if I, if I could talk and, and navigate the web here at the same time, I'd, I'd show you some of my tweets. But um, it, uh, 
it was it was addictive, satisfying. You know, I could uh, say whatever I wanted to very easily in, in 140 characters, and then elaborate by way of by way of a uh, uh, a link. And every time I posted something on my blog is how I started it. Before I started, just very compulsively. You know, I've I've tweeted three or four times since I've been here today. Um, the uh, I know just Lauren hasn't done it in a couple of days. You need to get I active. I really like Twitter. <laughs> I have a hard time with the 140 character woman. I've already retweeted you, so you're good. Oh, good, good, okay. Uh, the first thing I, I, I tweeted was uh, uh, when I walked into this building, and I, you know, after driving from Columbia, I immediately went looking for the restroom, and I saw one that said uh, ladies, and I saw one that said men. And I just tweeted out that fact and said, where's a gentleman to go? <laughs> or for that matter, a woman who's not a lady. Um, <laughs> Uh, having been an editor for so many decades, uh, you, you kind of obsess about words, and the imbalance there bothered me. Um, but anyway, uh, I used to get, so I started doing that. And I immediately found it to be like, uh, you know, when I was in school, I really found haiku a lot of fun, you know, when, when I was taught how to do that. And everybody's been forced to do that in school. But I really liked it, you know, I really liked doing that. And that's kind of what, uh, uh, Twitter is like for me, you know, that, that same kind of challenge to, to say something, say it well, uh, in a restrictive form, and it, it just, you know, strokes something in my brain. Some people it doesn't. Um, in fact, I tried briefly on my blog to, to do a daily news haiku. Uh, whatever the top story of the day was, I'd, I'd write a haiku about it, and it really just fell totally flat. My readers took no interest in it whatsoever, uh, so I quit doing it. But uh, when I was with the newspaper, editorial page editor of the state's largest newspaper, which it was back then, um, I had this, this you know, megaphone, this, this uh, soapbox, from which to promote my blog, which you know, I just did modestly. Every time I wrote anything, I'd have, have a little thing at the end saying, go to my blog. And I got to the point uh, that I was practically begging people, please don't read it in the paper. You know, go to the blog version because it's got all the links and, and back up, notes backing things up, uh, uh, multimedia, all kinds of stuff supporting it. And it got to where the print version just felt so dead to me, you know, and that I, I didn't want people to read it that way. But um, during that time, I, uh, I, was, I was very, I was more active than I am now because uh, it, it's, it was more integrated with my, my job then than it is now, working with an advertising marketing firm. And uh, I had, last few months, I was doing fairly well. I was getting about 45,000 page views a month, and uh, uh, which was not bad. The, be the best I'd ever done was during the, uh, was January 08, when we had the uh, you know, attention of the world here on South Carolina because of the presidential primaries. And um, I had like, I don't know, 80-something thousand that month. And so, you know, I thought that was great. But as soon as I started doing Twitter, and it, what I would do is I'd, you know, put my post on Twitter and a link to it, uh, the headline, although I re rewrite the headline, it's just a different form. Rewrite the headline, put the link to my blog, every time I post something on the blog, and then that is set up to automatically post to Facebook. Um, my, here I was, you know, just this guy out there, not at the newspaper anymore. But my readership just started shooting up. And now I, um, every month I've got better than 200,000 uh, page views. And I've, I've, I've broken a uh, quarter of a million a couple of times, which is nothing compared to the blog that Nancy works on. Uh, but uh, I, was, I was pleased, still am. Um, now, the, the, the great thing to me, about it, it, I'm unimpressed by, by Facebook. I, I, I hate it, in fact. Well, no, I like it for one thing. I like posting pictures of my grandchildren on it, you know. And for that reason, uh, being, you know, totally self-taught and -taught making things up as I go along, I made a huge error. Um, I, because I was using it to pro promote my blog, I just started approving everybody who wanted to be a friend. And, you know, I got up to about 900 before I said, you know, this is not a good idea. You know, this is where I put family pictures and everything, and I shouldn't do that anymore. So now I'm about to, to try to... Uh, uh, move people to a new page. 
And I've set up the page, I'm still working on it, but um, I'm really anticipating this being hard. Everybody tells me it's hard. Uh, I, I picture it being kind of like the, uh, uh, the roommate swap on uh, Seinfeld. I don't know if you remember the episode in which uh, Jerry was dating this woman and he decided he didn't want to go out with her anymore, but he was really attracted to her roommate. And so he sat down and, and talked to George about it, and, uh, and George said, ah, the roommate swap can't be done, my friend. And I feel kind of like getting all these people to follow me over to another page on, on Facebook is going to be kind of like that. I've heard people taking six months or a year to get anywhere with something like that, but I've, I've got to do it. Um, the, uh, but other than, you know, the thing about Facebook, I'm, I'm going to make a, a prediction that nobody will agree with. I think that a few years from now, uh, Facebook will be uh, like America Online. You know, uh, I feel about it today the way I felt about AOL 15 years ago. You know, as soon as it was easy to get onto the web, um, even though I had an AOL account, you know, I just didn't want to be there. You know, and there's all this junk and it was trying to be all things to me and, and bring me the world. I didn't need it, you know. Um, and and I, I kind of feel that way about Facebook. It's, it's junked up. They keep adding stuff to it. Um, it, it tries to be everything to me. It's a very inefficient way to get information to me. Other people think it's awesome, but uh, let's see where it is in 15 years. Uh, maybe it will have taken over the world and we'll all be working for it, but we'll see. Um, another thing that Scott suggested I talk about is about my blog, which is, for me, the point of it. Um, the, uh, I, get, I have about 14, 1,400, 1,430, uh, uh, followers on my blog, and that's, that's growing. I follow about 600 people. Um, the most, most fun about, you know, I, and I, I'm totally non-serious about this stuff, uh, which is why I, I have, have been unsuccessful at making it into a business, I guess. Um, I have fun. I, I write about, on my blog and in social media, I write about politics, particularly South Carolina politics, but I also write about whatever I want to, like uh, the other day, uh, top five baseball movies after uh, Moneyball came out. And someone, one of my regular readers, accused me of spending more time on a post like that than I do on the political ones. And I realized she's right. I, I worked harder at that than I, I do at most uh, political posts. But uh, you know, I like to have fun with it. I, I, I follow all the news uh, and, and uh, commentary type sites from you know, CNN to uh, the New Republic to, to whatever, uh, to, you know, know what's going on every minute. And um, at the same time, I follow uh, celebrities like uh, uh, Nathan Fillion, who was Captain Mal on Firefly. You know, uh, it makes him a hero of mine. And the awesome thing is every once in a while you get followed back by one of these people. Um, Adam Baldwin is one of my followers. Adam Baldwin was Jane Cobb on Firefly. If any of you ever watched Firefly, and we, we occasionally have exchanges back and forth. And uh, I am so impressed with that, and nobody on my blog is. You know, I, I, I'm always talking about it. And uh, so I haven't even talked to them about, uh, there's this guy, I read about a new phenomenon in the Wall Street Journal recently. I'm, I'm still very much ad addicted to old media. Um, uh, they're A-head, you know, in Wall Street Journal, they always have this really interesting feature story in the bottom center part of the page. And one day the A-head was about a phenomenon called chap hop, which is uh, hip hoppers in England who do hip hop in, in the mock style of 19th century English gentlemen. And uh, there was this guy called Professor Elemental. I started looking at his videos and he was just amazing. I thought he was fantastic. Well now Professor Elemental follows me and that doesn't impress anybody on my blog. I don't know why. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm blown away by it, and to me, it's, it's all about, that, that tells me what the real power of social media is. Scott suggested I talk about my blog, that's bradwarthen.com. Um, uh, I'm you know, he says, talk about content, political stance. My political stance is, as I was introduced, um, I do hate any political party that actually exists. Um, it, uh, you know, people are, 
Republicans are always accusing me of being a Democrat because I'm always criticizing them. Democrats are always accusing me of being a Republican because I'm always criticizing them. And of course, both of them can find evidence, you know, of uh, people I've, I've endorsed on the other side and, and that kind of thing. And, and uh, um, because I, I will like individual people, you know. And uh, of course, it was my job to endorse somebody uh, when I was at the newspaper. And uh, but but you know. Uh, I think that uh, the political parties, as they are currently uh, constituted, are, are uh, the most destructive force uh, in American politics. Um, of course, they are you know, the force in American politics, so I guess if they're destructive, they're going to be the most. Um, they, they, uh, they foster intellectual dishonesty, which is uh, inimical to uh, having a republic, to... to for, to the deliberative process uh, functioning, to people coming together in Congress or the legislature or wherever, and uh, you know, engaging in debate with people who disagree with them. We, we, don't, we don't have debates anymore, but uh, engaging in debate with people who disagree with them, actually listening, trying to figure out a way, okay, all right, how can I get done what I want to do and work with this guy and maybe, maybe even have my mind changed by, by a good argument? Um, you can't do that with parties as they are constituted today. Um, it is, people are dependent upon the parties to get elected, and they, uh, well, I mean, basically you are expected, and, and, and the level, you know, you see people break away. You see, you know, uh, you know, the John McCain, the Maverick, and all that kind of thing. Um, you'll see people break away from the party line to a great extent, um, although, you know, when. John McCain was pushing uh, the immigration, comprehensive immigration plan that made so many Republicans mad. He was doing the same thing George Bush was, you know, the same, same legislation. But anyway, um, the, the level of, of orthodoxy is just unbelievable. The, the, you, you must agree with someone who wears the same party level, label that you do, and you must disagree with someone who wears the other party label, and you cannot have intelligent, honest political discourse like that. Because, well, people tell me that they can because I really do believe all that stuff, but I find that absolutely incredible um, that anyone does. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've tried uh, several times to start my own party. I, I try. I write a blog post about it, you know, and then I move on to something else. Um, and uh, uh, my favorite is, is the unparty. Uh, I've, I've also created stuff called the energy party and something I... On, on a day when I was really impatient, the grown-up party. Um, most of these started as, as uh, some, some of them started as blog posts and they turned into uh, columns when I was with the newspaper. But uh, the end party has only one fundamental non-negotiable tenet, and that is an absolute opposition to non-negotiable tenets. Um, and, well, no, it has a second, which is that you uh, respect good ideas coming from the other side and have contempt for bad ideas coming from your side. Um, Scott had also suggested I talk about the impact social media has had on politics in the state of South Carolina, but I think these folks can address that better than I can, and I'm going to sit down and hope we have some good Q&A. Thank you. Just to make it official, I want you to know I actually tweeted that you are now my new hero, so it's official. Uh, to wrap up, before we go to Q&A, um, Ms. Ms. Mace, it's all yours. Um, thank you and good evening, everyone. I've got my clock right here to make sure I don't talk over. Um, just a quick bit of background, the Mace Group, um, we do PR, web, and design work for businesses, nonprofits, and political campaigns um, and political organizations. Um, the very first political website that I ever did was uh, in working with Will Folks and Fitznews.com. Um, just to back up a little bit, to give you a little bit of background on, on blogging, um, my former neighbor in Atlanta, we're, now the Mace Group is headquartered in Charleston now, but we just moved from Atlanta. But he was one of the first bloggers in the country. His blog was bump.net, and I think he was like the 10th blog, if we're going to get technical about it. But his inspiration was scripting news, and that's Dave Weiner's blog on scripting.com. And he has a huge mass of followers on Twitter, and if you're not following him, I think you should if you're interested in blogging and social media. Um, he was one of the first guys to actually blog. Um, but um, 
In 2003, um, a group of programmers got together and developed a platform for blogging called WordPress. And there are a bunch of other platforms out there like Blogger and, and others. Um, but uh, for websites, WordPress is really the only thing I recommend, even if you're a business or a political campaign. Uh, there are millions of websites using WordPress, whether it's the New York Times blog or a Lexus campaign for their latest car model or um, Speedo selling websites. A lot of these, these guys are using WordPress. Not everybody, but just about, just about everybody. Um, but uh, Twitter started out in 2006. Today, it has like 200 million users. Um, Facebook, 2004. And they now have 800 million users online. And that is just, that's like the whole internet. That's just enormous. Um, and they, have, they serve different purposes. Um, it, and there's some research to say that Twitter gives more click-throughs to websites than Facebook, and I would agree with that based on my experiences in social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, YouTube specifically, um, is that you'll see more clicks with Twitter because it's you have 140 characters and then a link generally at the end of that. Um, but in the political space, you're not selling widgets. You're not trying to convert people. So Twitter is a great tool to get people to, to refer people to your website, whereas Facebook is more of a branding tool. So it's great for businesses. It's great for campaigns as well. And you can kind of get a community sort of feel and get people to discuss different topics. So from a political standpoint, it's great to have that interaction on a Facebook fan page. But for clicks, you know, you have to do them both, Facebook for branding and then Twitter um, to help generate traffic, um, particularly to campaign websites or your political organization. Um, but I also wouldn't discount email. Email is, um, is enormous for getting people to refer to your website, whether it's a donation or uh, reading your latest um, policy. Um, but um, so for social media, Twitter, 140 characters is a microblog. But today it's more than that. You're breaking news on Twitter. Um, for instance, when Osama bin Laden was that attack happened, the first the first news of the attack happened on Twitter um, by somebody who didn't even realize what he was reporting on, but based on his tweet. Um, you know, the 24-hour news cycle is getting shorter and shorter because in the information age of of social media and Twitter and Facebook, people want information, they want it now. They don't want it five hours from now. They want to know what's going on right now. Um, and this, the social media has just sped that up dramatically. Um, you know, another national example would be Anthony, Anthony Weiner. I mean, he, that, that his, his entire political career was crushed by one tweet. Um, and, and of course, in South Carolina, you know, if you're Facebooking a racist remarks, that has gone viral a couple of times with folks. Um, but um, Fitz News also breaks a lot of news on Twitter. Uh, Will Folks is like the ultimate P.T. Barnum. I always like to nickname him, although he likes to call himself Sick Willie. Um, his work is backed by interviews and research and sources, all of whom want to mostly remain anonymous because of the, the nature of the news that he breaks. But um, we use Twitter extensively to sort of get ahead of blog posts that maybe he's working on. He'll tease people that he's working on a story on X, Y, and Z, and then he'll come out with it an hour or two later. But he's, you know, for a guy who didn't want to go into Twitter at all, uh, he's really mastered it uh, remarkably. Um, in the in the Twitter space, Republicans have they are they've gone crazy since Obama was elected president. I mean, Obama really kind of sort of paved the way with his online uh, campaign and social media, and so now I think you see a lot of folks trying to catch up. And Republicans, in particular, um, are all over the place. They tweet more than Democrats. McCain has he's the most followed on Twitter. He has 1.75 million uh, followers. Uh, on the Democratic side, it's um, Senator Claire McCaskill. You mentioned her earlier, Lauren. Um, she has 60,000 followers. Agenda Met here in South Carolina is about 115,000. Um, when it comes to news, like Fitz News, we have almost 8,000 followers on Twitter, which is pretty amazing, I think, considering that the state, the, the state's biggest newspaper, has about 11. Um, and so 
you know, that's pretty important to us um, because of the traffic that we get from, from the social media. So how did Fitz News come about? How did we kind of harness the blogging and balance social media um, to get to where we are today to almost 1.5 million page views a month and over 160,000 unique visitors a month? Um, when uh, there are three things, basically. It's content. Um, it's your inf information, it's your social media, it'd be the second component, and the third would be marketing, and that would be things like, maybe it's email, maybe it's uh, traditional PR, for instance, public relations. Um, we don't do any paid advertising, although I agree with Lauren, if you're on the campaign side, you need to be doing um, Google AdWords, AdSense, um, you know, having your name up in, when you search for it, et cetera, and whether you're doing graphic web ads would be a second component, but certainly for search and paid search, you, you know, campaigns, it's a necessity. Um, but um, Fitz News, in the fall of, uh, let's see, 2007, Will was trying to make a comment on Lauren Line, on Lauren's blog. She's kind of like, you know, the, the first South Carolinian blogger. Um, he was trying to comment on her blog, and this doesn't surprise me because he's not very technically savvy, but he accidentally created his own blog um, in the process. Instead of a comment, he accidentally created his own. Um, and eventually he got it on WordPress, um, and it was crazy, ugly, uh, it was terrible, it just looked awful. Um, but a friend forwarded me a link to it once uh, in, in 07. I had met him a couple years prior to this. I knew who he was and I knew that he was pretty politically savvy and kind of knew the, as I said, understood the political landscape in South Carolina um, better than anybody. But I saw what he was writing um, and I saw that he had a lot of potential in terms of his, his reach. One, he could write, unlike anybody else. Um, he was funny and he cursed a lot, and so um, I thought that would make a that would make a really good formula for kind of taking his blog in and making it expanding it. I had a lot of ideas for marketing it, and so I started pounding him with ideas. And sometimes they were story ideas, but but overall they were more on the marketing side or how how we should set up his blog and whether to have advertisers or not and who they should be and how do you do that and and. Um, how do you get more visitors to your website, et cetera. And so I would just, every week I think I was sending him ideas. And so eventually he took my advice and I came on board to um, help him take it to the next level and not just make it this one page sort of really ugly blog that put out you know, a couple stories a day. We wanted to expand it and really bring folks in South Carolina something that they didn't have. Um, you know, they couldn't find um, in other media sources or other blogs or mainstream media. Um, we've redesigned it since 07 probably two or three times. You know, w when we first started out, he had about 80,000 page views, 5,000 unique visitors a month. And so for Google AdWords, it's not very much. It was like 50 bucks was our first check. <laughs> so we were said, okay, we've got some work to do in order to make this thing uh, earn some money. And so uh, we put a lot of um, sweat into it, sweat equity into it and today it makes you know thousands of dollars a month because of the traffic and again it goes back to content um and so um two years ago i forced uh will to open up a twitter account kicking and screaming um and yesterday i looked at our analytics and our twitter account sent more referrals to the website like twice as many or three times as many as Facebook did. Um, and so for us, you know, having uh, Twitter, it's, it's, uh, it's critical, although we have to do the Facebook thing from a branding perspective. Um, you know, sometimes he'll get tweeted, get at mentioned, people will mention Fitz News, or they'll retweet a story that he's put on Twitter, um, you know, we can, 100 times a day or something. It's crazy how many times uh, people will tweet Fitz News and how many tweets we put out. And of course, we use a cool service called Twitter Feed. Um, and so depending on what the topic is, we can automatically designate popular hashtags for it. And I found that to be really useful if you're tweeting, Brad, that might be something you can look at. But um, to make sure that the content we're putting out, we're using popular hashtags to then help, you know, um, get more Twitter re retweets and everything else. And we just did a story, that I think, last week. I can't remember the topic. I've got mommy brain. But it was unrelated to politics. 
Um, and totally something that we would never, he would never write about, but we, we got like 15 retweets on something and it was the right hashtag and we had, a, you know, a dozen new followers after that. But, um, <clears throat> it takes a lot of work. It's not like you can just plug in a formula and, hey, it's going to work for everybody. It really depends on what your content is and who you're trying to reach. Um, but the, the traffic generated by Twitter is, is enormous for us and it's critical. Um, the other thing that we do that um, I think as a blogger or if you're generating content that people will see, uh, whether it's articles or posts, um, is Google News. The only way you can get into Google News is if you have more than one author, which Fitz News does, and if you have your contact information on a contact page. That's the, that's the two minimum requirements that you need for that. But Fitz News will have a story up there. It could be on anything. Um, sports or local politics or national politics and we've landed on the cover basically above the fold on Google News and you know millions of users you know will see that and then um, because we have images associated with our articles that again draws visitors in um, when you when you use that within Google News and so that's been a that was our first before before we got on Twitter Google News was like kind of where it's at and it still is when we have a story that is um, running above the fold on the front page there. Um, Fitz News has grown organically for the most part. We've, and we've done marketing and, and public relations, a lot of it. We get linked back from hundreds of websites, uh, thousands probably by now. Um, you know, Huffington Post, Washington Post, The Politico, Talking Points Memo, um, Harper's Magazine, those folks will, you know, sometimes pick up stories that Will has written and then they will link back. Not everybody does that. Um, but they will link to us when um, they're writing a story either about Fitz News or something that Will is broken. Um, and so having, you know, those link backs from really high ranking websites is also equally important. When you have 12,000 plus pages indexed in Google search engine um, and, then you're, and then you are um, linked by really high ranking websites like Washington Post, Politico, Huffington Post, um, <clears throat> again, that brings your level of exposure in search um, even greater. So um, on average, um, we're lately averaging, I'd say between 50 and 70,000 page views a day. I think August was almost 1.5 million page views. L this week, Will had a new baby boy. So they've been a little bit lower. They've been 40 to 50. But generally, we're in that kind of 60 uh, on up range um, per day. Um, and it drives me nuts when people make up figures or how we how Fitz News gets traffic. Um, some of it's luck, some of it's just pure stupidity how we've gotten it, um, and then and then it's a lot of sweat that goes into it. But here are some of the basic facts. This is just year to date based on uh, the Google Analytics. So I looked at them last night. Um, 1.1 million page views on average. Uh, we have over 160,000 absolute unique visitors. Generally, people are on the site for three minutes or a little bit over that, and they average about three pages that they'll read. So basically, they're reading two or three stories when they come and visit. Um, and 56% uh, of our readers are repeats, so they keep coming back. Um, and the numbers change every year. In fact, this I was just looking at this year to date. In 2010, I would say we had a third of our traffic was direct, a third was referral, maybe it was from a Politico link or um, some other third party website. And then we had a third from Google search engine. But this year, and I was actually surprised by this, but our traffic was 50% combined direct and referring. It was about 30% was direct traffic, 20% was referring from a third party site, and then 45% was from a search engine. Google usually. Um, and so I want to do some research in, 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 into that and, and, and find out why that's 10% higher than it was last year. I found that interesting. We've done a little more. We've installed an SEO you know, widget on our site and we're trying to, is it working? I think so after I'm looking at these, um, these numbers. And of course we have 12,000 pages indexed in Google um, and that's uh, huge for content and search. Um, the, fu the future of FITS, I, I think that <clears throat> we can still expand um, our readership. Um, we've just hired an advertising sales rep, so we're hopefully in the future won't just be dependent on Google ads. Um, we'll have you know campaigns and maybe businesses advertising on the site as long as <laughs> you know we're not too controversial. But um, but I think the future of FITS News lies in sort of figuring out how do you monetize the site and and still 
you know, keep all that content coming. I mean, because the first thing I want to do is hire a copy editor. I don't know if you guys read it, but um, we uh, definitely need to get a copy editor on board and, and more copywriters and even investigators. Fitz News receives, I don't know, a dozen tips a day probably easily. Um, and so we're constantly bombarded with, with tips that people want something or some organization or some department of the government investigated because uh, they were wronged, and it takes resources to do that. Fitz News has one editor. It's Will. I don't even touch editorial. Just do the technical and, and PR and marketing part of it. Um, but there's definitely, based on the feedback that we receive and based on what I see in terms of the tips and the emails that the website receives, it's definitely honed in on a market that was that had this gap and uh, was definitely interested in, in, in hearing what he has to say. So blogging, what's important? Um, YouTube, I think is also very important. It's something we haven't done a lot of, but I hope to do increase and do more of. When you search in Google now, your tweets pop up. You search your name, your tweets, and your Twitter account will pop up. When you search your YouTube account and YouTube videos with you in them or you tagged in them or mentioned will also pop up in Google. I think YouTube is critical um, for campaigns especially. Um, Flickr is good because you can integrate Flickr very easily into websites without having to do a lot of work. Um, and so then you have an easy, easy gallery. Let's say you're at a political event or a campaign fundraiser. You can, that evening in an hour, go put them online and then you're, they're on your website at the click of a button. Super easy. Um, Facebook is important, not as much for click-throughs, but it's more for the branding of maybe a campaign or an organization and maybe, and also creating a sense of community and also getting feedback from, maybe it's your constituents or your readers or the person who's buying your widget. Um, Twitter is critical for clicks and for um, generating traffic, at least from Fitz News perspective. I also think it's good for um, folks in campaigns because People need to know where you stand on an issue, particularly if it's something that's going on in the news cycle. You need to be able to quickly respond and get your opinion or uh, perspective out there. Google News is also essential for any blogger, but I think Google now has like a Google blog section. So if you're only one individual, you can show up in their Google blog searches. Um, but if you have more than one author, try and get in Google News. Um, solid code and programming is important. That's why I always recommend WordPress, because it's built I think that's search engine friendly, um, and it's free if you know what you're doing. It's easy um, to use. And then content is king. The most important thing to any you know, political website, Fitz News in particular, is content. The, you, people need to have a reason to come back to your website. So if you're doing a dozen articles a day like Fitz News does, people just keep coming back because they want to read an update, or they want to read more, or they want to read the comments. Um, and um, that's probably the most important component out of anything, is having good quality content. And that's it. Thank you. Before we depart, I have a number of thank yous I'd like to state. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all of our panelists for, for coming out for this symposia, as well to John Sweeney for moderating the second panel. I would also like to thank the Department of Mass Communication for co-sponsoring this event, and to Dr. Alyssa Waters, co-director of the McNair Center for her help in putting this symposium together. I cannot thank enough Dr. Fred Carter, the president of the university, uh, if, uh, for who, without whose generous support, symposia like this would be impossible. And lastly, I want to thank our audience for coming out here and to hear our panelists and to ask questions as well. Finally, Dr. Carter has graciously uh, invited all of us here to a reception at his home, Wallace House, uh, which will begin at 7.30, so I hope to see you there. Thank you again for coming.